lot of cash. I am James Gunn. I am the writer and director of The Suicide Squad. I'm here doing director's commentary, which I've done quite a few times before. And every time I do it, I tell myself, write down some notes so you know what you're going to say before you say it. And I never do that. And so everything I will be saying today is off the cuff from what I can remember about making this film, which we made a year ago. All right. Michael Rooker just called me yesterday. He's actually texting me right now about something. I don't know what. But one of his favorite things in the movie is this opening shot, which is something that was not in my storyboards. My movies are very, very storyboarded. I draw every single shot in the film before I shoot it. Uh, But this puddle was something that I saw on set. I saw that it had this cool reflection. So I knew that we had this circular camera movement thing out in the truck. And we brought it in and we did that opening shot, which I think is indicative of the whole movie in a way that everything is very planned out. But at the same time, I do come up with a lot of stuff on the spot and we'll come up with things on the spot to make things more creative. I have to give a shout out to Michael Rooker, my old friend who's been in all of my movies, who I've killed in many movies. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this director's commentary. Of course, I kill him in this movie as well. But he's very, very, very good at bouncing a ball without looking at it. And then there's Viola Davis, who I adore. Uh, She's just a fantastically intense actress. Very scary when she's Amanda Waller. That's John Ostrander as Dr. Fitzgibbon who created the Suicide Squad in the comic books. He's the one who created this concept of Z-grade supervillains who are used by the government in incredibly dangerous black ops missions. And I really wanted to go back to what John originally did with the stories in this movie. And this, this movie is very much inspired by the war caper films I grew up with loving as a kid watching on Saturday afternoons, especially the movies from the late 60s, early 70s, movies like The Dirty Dozen, Where Eagles Dare, Kelly's Heroes. That's what this movie is to me, just with DC supervillains. There we have Pete as Blackguard, and of course my brother Sean as the Weasel. Now that's actually... Sean's body, um, except for the very tiny penis, which is Weasel's. Yeah, you can see his little penis there. That's uh, that's just Weasel. That's not Sean. I don't think. I, I don't know what my brother's penis looks like. Anyway, there's Mei Ling Ng as Mongal, uh, Flula Borg as Javelin, my old friend Nathan Fillion as TDK, and they are together the original Suicide Squad, and of course Jai Courtney. That, this is who, what we call Team 1, and then the other team is Team 2. So when we referred to these guys on set, we talked about Team 1 and Team 2. And, uh, and here we're setting the stage with a bunch of numbskulls. Turn it around. No. That moment there between Nathan and Pete where he's helping him with his belt buckle, that was just something that Nathan and Pete did that was not scripted. People on Twitter love to find out when actors said things that were not scripted. So there you go. There's one of the things that was not scripted. Now here we have the team. These characters are all from the comic books. Amelia Harcourt is played by Jen Holland. Flo Crawley is Tanache. And John Economos is played by Steve Agee, my old friend. Flo Crawley is originally arrested at the end of the movie. Right now, that's not in the cut because it just kind of put a different spin on things at the end and we spent a lot of time doing things that I didn't know if we needed, so I cut it out. But she gets arrested at the end of the movie for hitting Amanda Waller in the head. And so the other two characters, Amelia Harcourt and John Economos, go on to be two of the leads in the Peacemaker TV series.
We have the uh, interior of the Osprey, which we had on stage to create this scene. And it was actually really, really long to begin with. Too long, frankly, and I, I cut it down. I cut out a lot of the dialogue. There's a little bit more of this almost kind of romance between Javelin and Margot's character, Harley Quinn. Yo, is this a dog? One of the great what? joys for me is, is with this creating dog? this movie was being able to work with Margot. I think David Ayer did a great job with some of the casting on the first film, especially Jai Courtney, Joel Kinnaman, Margot. Viola, and to be able to work with these actors who are all pretty flawless was a lot of fun. I think Joel, who found this movie a great challenge throughout because there's a lot of humor in it, and usually he's not playing roles with any humor, and so he found it really challenging and I know really fulfilling because of being able to do that, and he worked really hard on, on doing that, and I think he's fantastic in the film. That's Stevie Blackheart, my old friend, if anybody recognizes him, playing the character of Briscoe. I cut his role out, too, so... But he's been in a lot of my movies. Now, here we have the whole crew jumping down. This is a shot where the cameraman actually jumped off after the stuntman following him into the water. And the scene was difficult because it was shot in a big, huge pool on the back lot that we created also shot on a piece of beachfront that we created on set. Probably the biggest set I've ever created. We created an ocean front and forest on set in Atlanta, which is a set we're about to come to. And it had a gigantic beach, a gigantic forest, and also giant turbines that created waves. And that's where all these characters are going. That's a practical dead weasel that we created by Legacy, who did our makeup effects, and they created this dead body, so a lot of this is purely practical. And this is the beach that we built. We built this beach on the back lot in Atlanta. The weasel is dead! I repeat, the weasel is I think dead. it's good to note that Savant is saying the weasel is dead, and we find out at the end of the film, weasel is actually not dead, so you're trusting Savant to be good at taking pulses, which he's, he's not very good at doing. But also, I think, personally, that the weasel goes into a sort of dead state and panic, sort of like a possum, and so that his heartbeat does stop, which is why it says his heartbeat is stopped on the monitors. This was one of the first things that we shot when we shot the movie. We shot in two different locations. We shot in Atlanta, Georgia, and then we also shot in Panama, the country of Panama, in Panama City, a city called Cologne. But the first part was all in Atlanta, and this was the beach that we built there, and we shot a lot of the other stuff in the studios and around there, and we built a lot of giant sets. A lot of people know these are some of the biggest sets in Warner Brothers history, and they were really supportive in giving me the practical sets that I wanted. That's all palm trees that we brought in and put there for this scene. It's actually built in the edge of a real forest, but all of that is built. Hey, hey guys, whoa. We, got we have three different primary visual effects companies that we worked with. Uh, Trickster, uh, Frame Store and Trickster did a lot of the stuff at the beginning. Frame Store and Weta. And Weta did all of the Starfish and a lot of King Shark. Frame Store did a lot of King Shark. They're all companies that I've worked with before on the Guardians films. And Trickster did that visual effect on Pete Davidson's face where he gets shot in the face. With all due respect, we're in the middle of a goddamn Harvey And they also did this moment here, I believe. Part of the face that we've done with Pete Davidson, we actually shot his wound in real life and then superimposed that over the face. I really wanted to make a scene that was a lot like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan with just this sort of slaughter of supervillains. Um, these guys, as we find out, are all sort of the also-rans of the supervillain community. These are the people who... 
Amanda Waller either doesn't like or thinks are completely disposable. The only reason they're here at all is just to keep the troops distracted for a moment while the other team makes its way to the beach, who we'll see in a moment, who's the actual suicide squad that she's using to get the job done. To her, all these people are useless. And I think it sets up Amanda Waller as being the primary villain in the movie. Nathan Fillion, who plays TDK, the detachable kid, is one of the few superheroes who's not in the comics. He's created for the movie. Nathan Fillion's been one of my friends for a long time. He was a star of the first movie I directed called Slither, and he's done little things in almost all of my movies since, and we've worked together a lot, and we're just good pals. Here is the death of Captain Boomerang, which I think is shocking to some people because he was such a main character. But I felt like we really needed to have one of the main characters from David Ayer's movie be killed at the beginning of this movie to really give it a little bit more reality. All very hard to do with the marketing, you know, because the marketing, you got to sell this movie as the Suicide Squad, and we end up selling a lot, you know, the primary characters who you see throughout the whole movie. But really, to see this movie in the perfect situation would be to come into a movie theater, sit down, and know nothing about it. And then I think you can really enjoy it the best because you'd be so surprised when these characters who were setting up as the main stars are all sort of slaughtered at one time, including Savant, who really is the sort of protagonist of the first 12 minutes of the movie. And that was sort of my goal. I see we're at the 12-minute mark, and it really was about trying to make this all happen in about 12 minutes. You're supposed to have all of your main characters in the first 12 minutes of a movie. And that obviously isn't true in this film. We have a lot of characters we haven't met. That was part of the storyboards for the beginning was making these chapter titles uh, using actual physical elements from the screen, such as the blood there. If you notice, TDK is alive. He never dies. So I think there is a world where TDK and Weasel are wandering the jungles of Corto Maltese trying to survive together because they're both alive, really. I wanted to use people who died from the beginning. It's a song I've loved for a long time. Even going back to the days of when I wrote the movie Dawn of the Dead with Zack Snyder directing, we talked about using people who died in the end credits of that movie, which didn't happen for one reason or another. And so I've always wanted to use the song in some way, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity for it to be used. There's a lot of people here on the crew who are sort of my all of my favorite crew members who I worked with on all of my films uh, 
but uh, you know guardians of the galaxy one and two and super and slither and really i like to work with a tight family of people and also guardians three which kind of we were part way were into when i temporarily was gone and then came back i'm getting prepping to do that movie now actually but some of those people that really deserve a shout out i think are beth mickle who is our production designer who did an amazing job on the production design in this film and juliana makovsky who's our costume designer those two people are a part of every visual aspect of this movie and they're with me a lot on set way more so than a lot of costume designers and production designers kind of you know whispering in my ear giving me um, ideas about what works visually and what doesn't. And then Henry Bram, of course, the cinematographer who did Guardians Volume 2 with me. He's going to do Volume 3. And they are all really important parts of this filmmaking process. I think in terms of the cameras in this movie, it was very important to keep things alive all the time. If you notice, characters are almost always moving. Something's almost always happening. And we use a rig that was built especially for this movie called a Nano. It's a rig in which you can get sort of a handheld feel without having people get too seasick like they do with normal handheld rigs. And it houses extremely small cameras. We use the red cameras, weapons, and a dragon. And we're able to get in really close to characters and get around them and move around a lot and keep a visceral feeling with these camera rigs. This is Storm Reed. She is a young actress who I cannot speak highly enough of, both in terms of her professionalism, just what a sweet kid she is, and what an amazing actress she is. And it was really stunning for her to come on set and really own the day in the way she did. She was stunning. I know that Idris was blown away with her. And I love this scene, actually. There's a lot of comedy in the movie, and the, even the scene, there's a lot of comedy in it. But it's also dramatic. It's really sad. We see that Idris Elba's character, Robert Dubois, is actually, a, uh, he's a dick. It's not like he's just a pretend dick. He's not a guy that just loves his daughter unconditionally and goes out on these missions we never see. He really is mean to his daughter, and he has not taken her in. And it does take her life actually being threatened in a moment for him to agree to do the Suicide Squad. Because even at the beginning of the next scene, when Amanda Waller threatens her with imprisonment, he's sort of like, yeah, fine, okay. Put her in prison. She needs to learn her lesson. Let's harden her up. He is a hard guy. He's a mean guy. And this movie, for me, really is his story. To use a, a term that's been used a lot, it's about toxic masculinity. It's about this character who has been sort of defined uh, what society is and the way he becomes a hero at the end of the movie, I think is something that's not expected at all. But right here. So are you in juvie? No fucking problem. Not juvie. Yeah, see, he's, he's willing for his daughter to go to prison. It's really only when her life is actually threatened that he decides to do the Suicide Squad. If convicted could be sent right here to Old Bell Reeve. And in here, well... You know, Idris Elba is an actor who I have loved since The Wire, which is one of my favorite television shows of all time. I've always wanted to work with him. I thought he was a movie star and never really had uh, that perfect role for him to turn him into such. And so this was my attempt to give Idris something that was built just for him. I built the character of Bloodsport for Idris. I knew that I wanted Idris to star in the movie. I knew that I wanted to work with him. I talked to him very early on about the project. He was the first actor I talked to. And then I just had to find what character was I going to use. And we went through a lot of different DC characters, ones that you would not believe. But in the end, I felt that Bloodsport had a cool name. And his superpower in the comics was... A little bit silly. He's able to, like, pull weapons out of this netherworld. But I thought could be easily adapted to cinema with this suit that we would create for him, which has all these different weapons all over it. And that that suit was definitely the biggest challenge of any costume I've ever had to, to build with Judiana and with props because we all had to work together to 
figure out what parts of his costume did what, when did he use them, when, how would that work together with the shots that we had planned, what disappears when it disappears, when you're shooting out of order, that means part of his costume is disappearing as it goes on, and it was just a very complicated feat to create this character. And especially because I didn't decide to use Bloodsport until later in the game than some of these other characters. For instance, King Shark, I decided to use uh, from the very beginning of first writing the movie. He was one of the first characters I knew I wanted to use. I did write that role for Sylvester Stallone, who I've known for a while now, and I thought that he would be great for the character. However, we did audition a million people for the role, and uh, before I offered it to Sly, I always kind of thought of it as Sly, and I just wasn't sure if he would do it, I guess. And we auditioned a lot of people, and it just never worked out. We actually had a couple of people do the whole movie. Two voice actors did the whole movie, and none of those takes seemed to fill out the character. And so I asked Sly to do it. And it's a risk when you ask a big movie star to do something because they don't audition. You don't know what it's going to sound like. Sly came on and just killed it from the beginning. He filled out the character, and I was really grateful for him doing that. I guess I'll talk about each of the actors now, the, the, the main Suicide Squad. So that's uh, David Dasmalchian. David dasmalchian has been a, a friend of mine for a long time. We acted in a low-budget B-movie about 10 years ago and became friends. And I thought he was perfect for the sort of dour sadness of uh, Polka Dot Man. In the background there, you also saw Sean Gunn as Calendar Man. So in that scene, he's both Calendar Man and the Weasel. But David, I think, was perfect for this role, and he brings a haunted nature to this character. To me, in a lot of ways, Polka Dot Man really is the heart of this story because he is the silliest of all the supervillains. But within this movie, we see the silly supervillain who has this very dark, dark origin story. He has this disease that he was given by his mother who was trying to turn him into a superhero, and he's obviously gone against her wishes and done everything the opposite of that. Um, and so I really think that he is sort of the heart of the story in a lot of ways. To control of the Corto Maltese government in a violent military coup, the entire Herrera family were hanged in a public execution. Then we have Daniela uh, Melchior, who's a Portuguese actress. She was the one we had the hardest time searching for. We probably auditioned 300 actresses. We knew she was going to be a Latin actress, and she was written in that way. And so I auditioned actresses from all over the world, from Brazil, Mexico, Spain, Portugal, Argentina. Came down to three actors who we did a screen test with, one of whom was Daniela. When I first saw Daniela's very first audition, which was like recorded on an iPhone or something, there was something about it. Her presentation was so natural and so real and grounded I felt like it was really what we needed for this movie because one of the things that is important to me for this movie throughout the whole thing whether it's the production design the style of the acting or the cinematography it's to keep things real and grounded despite being as outlandish as it is and so Daniela seemed perfect for that. And she reminded me of one of these old French New Wave actresses or an early Fellini actress. And she has this different feel to her that I think is very old fashioned, but also very new and different. And I really think that she's something extraordinarily special and was incredibly easy to deal with and is a real sweet human being as well. So I was happy with her. And then also we'll have to talk about my friend John Cena, who obviously I love because I went from this movie to agree to doing a TV series with the character of Peacemaker. And John is probably the most gifted improvisational actor I've ever worked with in my life. And that's saying something because I've worked with a lot of really gifted comedians. And I also thought that this movie showed a part of 
John Cena that we haven't seen before, which is this dramatic part that we see later on in his confrontation with Rick Flagg. And I think it stretched uh, John's abilities in a way that he hadn't done before. And it was a lot of fun and it came very naturally. And so I thought that there was a lot with this character that we hadn't seen. John and I talked a lot about Peacemaker and who he is. And he is this sort of alt-right dickhead douchebag dirtbag who also has these ideals that even he can't live up to. But I also think there's something very sad about the character. I think he's using those ideals and all of those things because he has a hard time connecting to other human beings. And so John and I talked a lot about that throughout uh, filming. He's always outside. He feels like he's outside. Oh, yeah? Here we have uh, Flew the Borg's death scene, which I think he did quite well. And he is another great guy. I have to say, also probably has the best body of any actor I've ever worked with. <laughs> and I've worked with all these muscular superheroes. And yet this German comedian has the most fit body of anybody. Usually our costumes have a lot of muscles where there aren't and fake butts where there aren't butts. Every single superhero uh, I've ever worked with has had a lot of stuff like that, except for Flula. He didn't need it. So there's my props to Flula's kicking bod. This is actually a sequence we had a little bit of difficulty with because I, I did have a whole other section here with Rick Flagg and TDK and Harley. Here's Elise Braga, um, Sol Saria, uh, another wonderful actor that we were able to work with and I was very pleased was willing to do this role. Uh, but anyway, I had this scene with TDK and, and Rick Flagg and Harley running through the forest that I cut uh, to sort of simplify things because things were just getting a little bit too fat at the beginning. There's too too much stuff happening before we got to the real stuff, which is starting to happen now, which is the real group and the conflicts they have. So this sequence actually sets up a lot of those conflicts. Um, this sequence that we're about to see sets up, number one, we see this awful disease that's all practical effects by the way done by legacy who has this sort of horrible polka dot disease and we see that the joke of him being the polka dot man may not be as funny underneath the surface and so what it's supposed to be is that he has these terrible interdimensional polka dots that are eating him alive and he kind of has to go and you know expel them from his body uh, a couple of times a day or else they'll kill him. There we have King Shark, who is really just a fish who wants to eat people, um, about to eat Rat Catcher, uh, who, um, strangely enough, ends up being the, the, the person who loves King Shark the most. You know, she's Rat Catcher. She's an animal person innately, so she comes to love this big goof, um, even though he may not deserve it. We'll see throughout the entire movie that Ratcatcher 2, you know, I call it Ratcatcher, but Ratcatcher 2 falls asleep constantly all the time. This scene was another scene I had a lot of problems with. We shot this scene. I just, it, it seemed messy. It seemed weird. I remember feeling weird about it on the day. Um, I made some poor directorial choices. In a second, we'll see John Cena laughing at Idris Elba's character and I think I had too much laughing at one point, so I tried to cut around the laughing, which was hard to do. Um, and it's about, you know, it's about Idris Elba showing that he has this, what his weakness is. His his kryptonite is rats. Get off of me for, man. Why the fuck are you in your underwear? 
Tidy whiteies, really? Now that's just racist. No, it's not racist. Him claiming that saying tidy whiteies was racist was not in the script. That was John Cena making that up. That is Sebastian the Rat, one of my favorite characters in the movie. I had pet rats growing up. I love rats. I think they are a fantastic pet. I think people have way too many hamsters and gerbils. They're animals that really don't care about you and can bite you. And rats are really much sweeter pets. I'm not saying wild rats. I'm not a big fan of wild rats. But, but domesticated rats, are they're a great small pet. Great first pet for a child. That's my rat commercial for everyone out there. Team, if we got to watch our back from one of our own, some our great hearts. effects by Frame Store here. I love watching this moment with King Shark. Eat your friends. This is uh, the score is by a fellow named John Murphy. John Murphy has been one of my favorite uh, composers for a long time. So when I had an opportunity to pick a composer for this film, he was my first thought. I loved his work from 28 Days Later, other Danny Boyle films, and I thought he would be a great person to work with on the score. And boy, did he deliver. He's really created a sort of an iconic score that I love. So here we have the mission of trying to find Rick Flagg and save Rick Flagg. We think he's been taken by the enemy. Waller sends him in. She explicitly gives them orders to kill everyone in his path, which they do. This was an interesting thing that happens in filmmaking process. So I usually start with writing the script. I write the screenplay first. I write it out and know exactly what's going to happen. But a scene like this in the screenplay basically said Peacemaker and Bloodsport start to compete with who they're killing. And it didn't really say what was going to happen. It wasn't until I sat down to draw the storyboards that this action scene unfurled. And this action scene is exactly what I storyboarded from start to finish. And it was really then to me that it came to life what exactly was occurring. And it is this sort of macho posturing between these two guys. And we see the sort of wreckage that results from that sort of macho posturing of Bloodsport and Peacemaker, these two over-masculinized guys because of their own insecurities, insecurities that we sort of face for Bloodsport within this movie and insecurities we'll start to face for Peacemaker in his series. I think here these two guys are really showing off to each other. <laughs> this this moment here that Cena does that wasn't that was also not in the script. But there was also a moment that I wondered about keeping, where he did something much much more foul than that, and I thought about keeping, but it was just too much. That's one of my favorite moments when he's stabbing the sleeping guy for no reason, casually. And also these guys, of course, are using their, like, kind of crazy weapons throughout just to show how cool they are. And I kind of think the ultimate version of that is the blow dart, which is not exactly something that you, you uh, think of when you think of superheroes or superheroism. And I think down below we're to believe that there's all sorts of things that whatever Bloodsport is doing down there 
um, that we don't quite see. But somehow, by the time we come down, it's escalated to him lighting people on fire. Now, this set was an interesting set. So this set was actually built on a soundstage. This is all inside of a building in a soundstage. There's a, a penis man that is one of the reasons we got uh, graphic nudity, just because of some somebody's penis. But he was outside drinking his coffee, enjoying the sunlight on his genitals, and uh, then was rudely killed. Anyway, this was built on a soundstage, and because it wasn't quite long enough for the stretch that I needed, that central bit of huts, I had to keep moving them from day to day. So we did one day when they were pushed up, then we pushed them back and pushed them back again to give us enough space at the front of the stage for them to approach here. And here we get to see Polka Dot Man's powers for the first time, and it ends up that he's probably the most powerful person in the group. Although Rat Catcher certainly could hold that title as well. But it definitely is not Bloodsport and Peacemaker. And here we reveal that after them having killed everybody on the gorilla camp, there was no reason for it, as they had saved... Rick Flag and are taking care of him. And then here Sebastian chimes in. By the way, we had a uh, we had an actor, and I and I wish I, I remembered his name off the top of my head, but an actor does most of Sebastian's squeaks, um, and he was amazing. I mean, he came in and did all of those squeaks. Like, right? That's a that's a human making that noise, and he's uh, he's fantastic. He's credited, and then also Sebastian is sometimes a CG character, and sometimes he's an actual rat. And we had two rats on set that were primarily. Sebastian. They were both female rats, actually. One was named Crisp Rat, named after my friend Chris Pratt, of course, and one named Jaws. And they were incredibly sweet little guys. They each had a different set of skills, so we used Jaws or Crisp Rat, depending on what the moment was. And once we decided we were going to make this movie, we started training rats right away. So they grew up being trained to, to be in this film. Rats actually don't live very long, so I hope they're. I hope Jaws and Chris Pratt are still alive and doing well somewhere. They have not written for a long time. This is friendly. Here we have Peter Capaldi. We finally, 38 minutes into the film, we reveal another one of our primary characters. What is this? And then again, even more of our characters. I mean, we really reveal a lot of our characters here. So there we have Luna, Joaquin Casio as Suarez. Joaquin, I, I didn't know him. I knew of him from the TV show Narcos, which my friend runs that show. And I wrote this role for him, not knowing him. And after I had written it, I wrote my friend and said, is he a nice guy? Is he cool? And he's like, oh, he's my favorite actor I've ever worked with. And he really is the sweetest guy in the world. And Juan Diego as Luna is just another great guy. These are fantastic guys. That's the first time we ever see Starro, Starro the Conqueror. When I was a little kid, I hated him. I just, I actually thought he was terrifying. And I love these visual effects by Weta here of the, the Starros being born. This was the first thing we shot, actually, for the whole movie. We did a pre-shoot of these astronauts. And that's Katie, one of our stunt people. And I, I love the moment where she's pretending to smoke a cigarette while she leans on Starro. It's such a dick move. It's been 
But these are our ostensibly our villains. I do not actually believe that any of them are the main villains in the movie. To me, the primary villain in the film, the primary antagonist, is Amanda Waller. She's the one that is really putting our heroes in this position. Where is this Project Starfish now? And here we come to see, we don't quite see him yet, but they approach Starro the Conqueror as he's been put into this basement where they've been holding him for 35 or so years. That's Vera. You know, all these actors have little things. Like you kind of see here, we have Luna with his two generals on his side. Vera, strangely enough, is a guy who... <laughs> I His name sounded familiar when I when I hired him and I saw his audition and we cast him and I saw his name on the call sheet. I'm like, boy, that name sounds familiar. And... He actually played one role as a cop in my movie, Super, which I made in Shreveport, Louisiana in 2010. And I hired the guy again without realizing that. We called these guys Mario and Luigi. We tried to make them look like Mario and Luigi, so she calls them Mario and Luigi. And, and they, they were quite a pair in real life end in the movie and here's a sort of sweet moment with margo that's heba and janine our makeup and hair departments who are in the limo with harley margo is honestly just one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. And she's very different for a movie star in that she doesn't have, I guess, I guess, ego. She doesn't seem to have an ego in the way a lot of movie stars do. And it was really just a complete pleasure to work with her. She's really about the work. She works hours and hours on the stunts. And she's fantastically athletic, as well as being an incredible actress who's able to do comedy and drama easily. Senorita Quinn, on behalf of the entire staff of our Honorable General President Silvio Terio Luna, it's a pleasure to serve you. Another grand set from my money from Beth Mickle, who just, we built this whole set on stage. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I love the colors. And I love the way this, this all plays out with her and Juan Diego, Juan Diego Bota. One, Coronel Vita. People talk about the tattoos a little bit. You know, some of her tattoos have changed from the other two movies the character of Harley Quinn was in. Used to be a property of Joker on the back. Now it's a property of no one, as you see there. And she used to have a rotten tattoo on her face, which I was never a big fan of. And Margot was not a big fan of either. So together we fortunately jointly agreed to remove rotten, just, just kind of pretend it didn't happen. Harley Quinn's fire and rebellion in the face. So we have a song here, Whistle by the Choir, which is a really cute little song to show the love affair of Harley and Luna. And they're, you know, and she's quick to love, I think, and falls in love with him. But obviously this love does not last too long, as we will see shortly. This was a lot of fun to shoot. All these lorikeets, they were little maniacs, actually. And you just have to take some food, and then they're all over you. Yeah, she's holding food in her hand right there. I think we took it out. But that was different plates of the lorikeets. So we shot different plates at different speed, put them in front of and behind her, and then sort of meshed all of this stuff together. In, in the shots where we're pushing in on her, I actually put her on a dolly and twisted her and moved her towards us as we're pushing towards her. So that gives it that effect. And then we had two dollies in the center of the room where they were moving towards each other. So that's really them in this little lorikeet cage with this pretty 
you know, complex series of dollies to get all of the shots we needed and the movement that we needed. <laughs> You hear her feelings are hurt because she thinks he just wants to marry her because she's anti-American. But as it ends up, he's says he really loves her. I agreed to meet with you just to appease them. The, the, the question here is, is Luna telling the truth or is he just, you know, manipulating her? But I think he really does like her. So I think he's sort of into her. You are perfect. You were so freaking hot. And here we have our big love scene. sort of batter each other about we had to get a lot of fake props our prop guy drew is another guy who uh deserves a shout out just the, one of the best prop guys i've ever worked with if not the very best he did a fantastic job on the movie Harley Luna. believe it or not that's two different shots put together <laughs> sometimes i hate betraying our secrets but I liked one part of the shot better than the other, and I mushed them and just kind of split them down the middle and put the two of them side by side in the piece that I liked the best of each of them. Fred Raskin and Chris Wagner edited this movie, and they're both really talented editors. Fred is the guy I've worked with on both Guardians movies and on this, and on Peacemaker. I also love Harley's red dress, designed by Juliana. It's something that I had in mind from the beginning of taking this on. In fact, this scene is actually one of the very first scenes that I wrote for the movie. When I'm thinking up ideas for something, I write down little notes. And this whole scene sort of came pretty well formed. But it's just this idea that Harley is done with nonsense. We think for a moment perhaps she's being sucked in by another sort of alpha male who is you know using her an insane alpha male like joker but the minute she finds out that that's who he is she has changed and she shows personal growth in her own way which is of course to brutally murder him which she explains in a moment but that's the speech she gives and i think it's an opportunity to show another piece of harley and it and it shows how both how she's grown and how she's still so completely messed up that murder is spiritual growth as far as Harley is concerned. To feed the beast. We see how these characters are all pretty damaged and seeing this little glimpse of Harley and she talks about the cruelty uh, that she's experienced in her life. I do like that the thing that she thinks is the worst is that the teller music isn't her music. <laughs> it's a little bit worse than slashing your tires or killing your dogs. Margot's view of Harley is Harley's pretty sociopathic, like even more so like I think Harley has something good in her. I, I, I really do. And Margot is a little bit harsher with Harley than I am. But I do think that Maybe that's how Margot looks at the character for the character to be the character. And we both talked about one of the things that we do think is that she would not be cool with killing kids and she would not be cool with killing dogs or puppies or animals. And so that's kind of where her lines are drawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think here's the irony of the whole thing is that we see her kill Luna, who is the, the, the bad guy at this point. 
and we see who now who Luna is being replaced by, and he's obviously a much more unhinged guy than Luna was. Luna was the guy who takes care of the lorikeets and had some sort of tenderness or softness or something to him besides just pure cruelty. And Suarez does not. Suarez is a pretty bad guy. And there's a lot of arguments to be made that Suarez is the worst person in the whole movie. P played by probably the nicest guy in the whole movie, which is the irony. I did question the scene because it is, in a weird way, one of the more violent or cruel or darker things that happens in the movie is lighting a whole bunch of birds on fire and hearing them scream. So I, I didn't want to show it and didn't, obviously, uh, being an animal lover myself, but I thought having it in there was fine. So, of course, we built all these titles. That's not just a visual effect. We built that in the ground, and he's getting up from the title there. What the hell are you doing? We're tired, Colonel. We need a rest. Goddamn hobbyists. We cannot stop. This, again, was on the sound stage where we built the jungle. Now, what we did with the jungle was we reformed it a couple times. So we took the gorilla camp out and then just made it a more full jungle so that they could walk around all the stage on a pathway and it would take, you know, quite a few minutes to get around it. That shit's contagious. We need to know. It's not. People always say, isn't it a lot cheaper to just shoot in the jungle? And it's not really a lot cheaper. I mean, number one, you have a harder time getting the shots that you really want to get, you know. And it's, you know, you got to bring these generators out in the heat, out with the mosquitoes, and... It can be very, very difficult, so it's not necessarily cheaper. She infected me. People ask me a lot about Rick Flagg's T-shirt. Rick Flagg's T-shirt is a drawing that I did of a character named Ultra Bunny, and I just had done this sketch, and we turned that into a T-shirt. So I created Ultra Bunny. We put that on the shirt. It says, obstacles are opportunities. In Spanish, obstacles are opportunities is the slogan that we use on set all the time. That is our main uh, phrase that I use with the producer, Peter Safran, and Simon Hatt, our other producer, and Chuck Roven. And when problems arise, we say, obstacles are opportunities. And if obstacles are opportunities, how does this giant thing that seems to be screwing us up right now, how will it help us in the long run? Where is the opportunity in this obstacle? And usually you find out that there is some sort of opportunity in there. This was a difficult scene to choreograph because I wanted it to take lar largely take place within one shot. And so it was hard to get everything right on every take. And that's Julio who plays Milton. Milton, of course, is the unheralded member of the Suicide Squad. Magatita Mable is the strip club brothel where Thinker hangs out, where they're, they're headed to. King Shark obviously doesn't have a full recognition of how different he is from other human beings. See? Hey, he's learning Spanish. And what kind of these guys? Fake mustache. Yeah, fake mustache isn't going to cut it, mate. Here we have this moment between Rick Flagg and Solceria. I think there's something. I think there's maybe a little something there. I love the character of Rick Flagg in this movie. I love the character of Rick Flagg in the comics. And I think he's one of the characters who changed the most from the first film. And, and Joel and I talked a lot about that 
from the beginning. I do think he's a little bit lighter. He's a little bit funnier. He's got a little bit more of an accent, I think. I really like the character. Here, poor King Shark is really upset about not being able to wear a fake mustache. Fake mustache. In one of our little Easter eggs, Senator Cray is a senator in the comics who Rick Flagg tries to go kill in the John Ostrander Suicide Squad comics, and the character Deadshot kills him instead after being sent to stop Rick Flagg. And maybe we'll have that sometime in the future. Who knows? We're losing connection. I'll tell you, the toughest visual effect in this whole movie was putting the city of Corto Maltese outside these windows now we shot all of these plates outside in panama shot like that looks pretty good but the wide shots are very very hard to get right and make them look real and i'm i still am not always totally happy with them and scanline did an amazing job on putting these shots together the visual effect company but it's a very difficult thing to do put that outside these windows daughter you This is Jesse Rios, who sings the song Sola, which is the song that's playing right now. She is one of my favorite artists. And strangely, another one of my favorite artists is Grandson. Grandson wrote a song called Oh No, which I used in the promotional materials for the Suicide Squad when we first did DC Fandom. And then I used the song over the end credits. And I have a relationship with Grandson because we like each other's stuff. So I wrote him and said, hey, would you mind trying to write a song? I, I may not be able to use it, but is there a song that you could write for the movie? And he wrote the song Rain, which I love. And he gave to me and we use it in the movie not too long. But the weird thing is, is Jesse, who's one of my other favorite artists, is the one who sings the song with him. And it's just pure coincidence. So this is Taika Waititi as Ratcatcher 1 plays Daniela's father, Taika, of course, is another guy who's directed Marvel movies. He's also a really funny comedic actor, and I asked him if he would come in and do a, a one-day role for me of playing her dad, and he did great. And he was great with this little girl who's a fantastic little actress. He was really good with her. I was in Panama actually shooting the outdoor section of this stuff, when Taika won his Oscar, which was quite a exciting moment. There's this fantastical, you know, one of the, the fun things about making this movie was having no rules. And Warner Brothers was fantastic about saying, hey, you can do whatever you want. You can kill whoever you want. You can take left turns when people are expecting a right turn. And so we really took advantage of that. I'm like, if I am able to make a big budget movie, which has no rules, then I'm going to take full advantage of that while I can. And that's really what this movie is. And so we let the soft moments be soft. We let the magical moments be magical. There's this magical realism element to it because we combine this sort of very naturalistic, almost cinema very feel with these magical moments of flowers and titles and seeing the past through the windows and being able to mix those things together in a way that is normally not seen outside of a, a low-budget independent movie. I'm incredibly grateful to Warner Brothers for allowing me to do that and allowing me to really take chances with this movie. This was shot in the, the city of Panama City. The La Gatita is actually like a sort of a bodega, a, a quickie mart. But the inside was shot in Atlanta. This interior is all in Atlanta at a strip club.
That's Palm Clementi of who is Mantis from the Marvel movies. And Palm is one of my very closest friends. She was in Atlanta shooting uh, another movie during this time. And so she hung out with us all the time. And there's all these pictures online you can go see of the Suicide Squad hanging out. And Palm is always with us because she was just with us for many months. And she'd come on set all the time. She hung out with me all the time on set. And I said, would you do this? You want to play a, a dancer in the strip club? And she took it seriously. She went and she learned this goofy dance. I had this whole philosophy that, you know, we wanted to create this Corto Maltesian culture. Obviously, it's a mishmash of a lot of Latin cultures. And we have all sorts of different. I mean, we have a Mexican actor. We have a Brazilian actor. We have a Portuguese actor. We have a Spanish actor who are all denizens of Corto Maltese. And so it wanted to be this mishmash, but also create this own culture and this idea that maybe these brothels have these dancers who wear these traditional sort of weird macrame outfits that they've been wearing for 300 years as they do their provocative dances on stage and that it's a weird kind of dance that we haven't seen before. This to me is one of the really the saddest moments in the whole movie this is maybe the saddest moment rick flag says moments before here's to being alive in three hours and a lot of these characters will not be alive in three hours and they're actually experiencing camaraderie and some joy and togetherness for the first time together for certain that's also him dancing with his mother and his mother was a fantastic actress and a real sport for putting up with all that nonsense but, uh, you know, all these actors are experiencing this sort of togetherness and then things go very, very south and not too long. So it's one of my favorite moments in the movie, shooting that stuff and, and looking, watching the scene. And it's also, to me, one of the kind of most bittersweet moments in the movie. Peter Capaldi played Doctor Who. A lot of people think that I picked him because of of that but it isn't it's a movie called in the loop that i saw where i loved peter capaldi in that movie and when his name came up as a potential thinker i'm like absolutely let's offer it to him and we we gave it to him and he just he's the sweetest guy fantastic actor and a fantastic artist who made me a big piece of thinker art at the end of this shoot I let all the actors sort of, they, they help to pick out their stupid outfits. It's like all of these guys are wearing clothes that they found in a box that, <laughs> that the gorilla camp had. So like his is like, it's supposed to be from a country club that they have to wear these jackets or something like you know, the waiters have to wear these jackets. And that's what Idris, <laughs> Idris is wearing. He chose the beret and the, the sandals, the mandals. He's got the mandals on for much of these scenes, which I thought was hilarious. This is my friend, Mike Escamilla. He's a BMX rider. He does a lot of stunts in my movies. He also did stunts in Guardians 2 a lot. He's, and he gets killed probably in this movie five times. But Mike, he had his name on the call sheet. And they're like, what should we call your character? Because I gave him this line. And he said, call me uh, the handsome soldier. So the handsome soldado, actually. And they called him the handsome soldado on the call sheet. So when I went to give him a credit, I wanted him to be... <laughs> The Ugly Soldado, and I had that in there, and then I found out I didn't get to call him the Ugly Soldado. But if anyone wants to go into IMDb and credit him as the Ugly Soldado, I'll be really happy. Oh God. I think Polka Dot Man has probably never been around a naked woman, so he's very embarrassed by that moment.
Here is the song Rain by Grandson and Jesse Reyes, which they wrote for this movie. So this is all shot in Panama, Panama City. It has just a great texture to it that I didn't think this could be matched elsewhere. When I wrote Corto Maltese, I didn't really know where we were going to shoot it. I was going to shoot in Havana, but it ended up being sort of difficult, and so we searched for someplace else to shoot it. And I wanted that beautiful, aging color palette that you have in some Latin American countries. And when I saw Panama for the first time, in certain parts of Panama, not all of Panama, but certain parts of Panama really had what I was looking for. And so it was just a really, it was a joy shooting down there for the most part and a lot of great people. And they really welcomed us and it gave us a great sense of realness in the film. The death touch. How to kill a man with a single pill. Idris does not smoke. He has asthma. And his eyes were watering up. This guy really doesn't smoke. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and he, his eyes were watering up, and I had to take a tear out of his eye, visual effects at one point, because I liked the shot. So Guy Norris is our stunt coordinator, and he was also our second unit director. And Guy Norris shot most of this stuff on the street based on storyboards and animatics that we had worked on together. I've actually known Guy since doing the first Scooby-Doo movie, which I wrote. And he does George Miller's movies, of course, which have some of the best action sequences ever, if not the best. And Guy was a real pleasure to work with on this movie. Just a fantastic collaborator. I'm going to get home tonight, and I'm going to remember people that I haven't mentioned on this director's commentary and just be so sad about it. But to all those people that are listening to this commentary waiting for their names to be mentioned, I'm sorry. I really appreciate you because making this movie was the greatest joy of my life in a lot of ways up until now. And there really weren't many weak points in terms of our cast and crew. And that goes from the number one on the call sheet all the way down to, you know, our PAs and location scouts and stuff. They were fantastic. Now, this was shot in Atlanta, and it was a hard, another hard visual effect shot to get right. I have some paintings of old pulp novel covers in my living room at home. And one of them is a, a pulp novel cover called Action Team. And it has like these three guys coming out with shotguns of a, of a van with like Lacoste shirts on. And that's what I wanted to base that image on, this sort of cheesy, silly dudes wearing goofy clothes coming out of a van. So it really is. I'll have to post that picture on Instagram at some point because that's what it's based on. And I gave that to the cinematographer and everybody else to show them what I wanted it to be. People say, what was the most fun day you had on set? And I'm always afraid to say, because it was this day, <laughs> which was a blast. I, I, because Margot is just so great at what she does. And it was really easy. It was like in one room. And it had a lot of, you know, kind of complicated shots, but they all went really well. This guy who plays the brutal guard was a great guy. You know, Joaquin, of course, is my favorite. So it was just a really fun day overall an easy day in a lot of ways so <laughs> that day we shot that all the way to her killing the, the brutal guard and it, for some reason it was just a really fun day of shooting now this is again as we're back in Panama City for all this stuff except for the inside where this is shot on a sound stage There's a great outtake where one of the times that Idris threw that gun to uh, 
David Dasmalchian, David didn't catch it and it hit him in the, the, the nuts and he collapsed and everybody fell into hysterics. And really, he really was hurt, but he was okay. That's another improv on the part of old John Cena. Sammy from the Wall of Unseen. Now, if you ask me what's my favorite sequence in the movie, you know, there's a lot of different things I love. I love the ending with the rats. I love the, the gorilla camp scene. I love the opening scene. But really, this, this sequence is, is probably my favorite. I think it's probably my favorite action sequence I've ever shot. It has stayed pretty much the way I envisioned it from the very first moment. And so one of the things with the action sequences it was to have it build and change throughout. A lot of movies, I, you know, action sequences can go on for a long time, but they don't change enough for me, and they don't build, and they aren't part of a story. And for this, it really was about the different stages. From She starts with killing him here, then she goes into the little sort of straight-ahead gunplay of the next scene, into the Umbrellas of Cherbourg killing scene, where she's shooting everybody into the hardcore born ultimatum action sequence with the gates, but with humor. And then the sort of surrealistic moment of the bullets with the flowers at the end and, and then into nothing. And then into just her treating it like an ordinary day. It took a lot of planning, but it really didn't change much since really since writing. And so all of this stuff was pretty much designed by me in terms of the shots and everything up until what we're going to get to in a second when she runs. Now this shot is a this next shot. That shot there, that's a shot you just couldn't get before you had the nano. You couldn't chase somebody like that and go that fast. But anyway, so w this scene was Guy Norris's babies. And I even wrote in my storyboards, you know, this is where Guy Norris earns his money. And so he did put this piece of the, the action sequence together and did a fantastic job. And then I have a certain way of shooting stuff that I do that. But it was uh, fantastic work on Guy's. It wasn't second unit. We shot it all first unit. But it was Guy kind of putting this fight scene together in a way that with other movies I've maybe been a little bit more controlling and have you know designed stuff more myself definitely the most violent thing in the movie is that that's the one thing I question I'm like is that just too much and her dead eyed look uh, but I liked it even though she picks up the machine gun in a funny way at the end But I love this moment. I mean, this is, to me is really just, you know, people are either on board by this time or they're not. And the idea of the flowers and the sort of postmodern elements that happen in this scene, we're obviously seeing it in a way through Harley's mind, um, I think was a risky thing in the movie. And uh, I, I hope people enjoy it. I do. I love it. I love watching it. It's fun. And most of these, now Ingrid is the name of, uh, of uh, Margot's stunt double, and she does a lot of fantastic work. But uh, Margot also did a great deal of this scene, if not most of it. She didn't do the walking up the walls. But she does a lot of stuff here, and she worked on the scene for a long time and did a great job with it. And her and Ingrid are a great team together when putting this stuff together. We have all these little birds. I actually had a moment in which I used to have Ultra Bunny, the, the character from Rick Flagg's shirt, uh, doing a little dance there at the end, but I felt like maybe it was just a little bit too much happening at one time. And one of my favorite things about this is just Harley coming out at the end of this enormous action sequence with all this stuff happening, and she doesn't really bat an eye. That's a, that's a day at the office for her. She's, like, coming home from work, as would anybody. But the magic is still there behind her. The whole idea here is that these guys have parts of their costumes on, but not the whole costumes, because they were rushing to come and save her.
This was all shot in the same place. There's the bird shot. That I thought of when I was on the set. That's actually John up in that tower, and that he was scared to death because he's afraid of heights. This day, I got to say, uh, was uh, a day in which I was in Panama. And I found out that my dog, who was about 17 years old and was the best friend I ever had, uh, was uh, about to die. And I had to direct this scene. And luckily, uh, you know, everybody involved with the production um, supported me in going home to, to be with my dog, Wesley, as he died. And... Um, it was a very, very touching thing to me how sweet everyone was about it. But I was not present during the scene. I gave a lot of notes, but I certainly wasn't present. And it was difficult because of that. But we took off. We shut down production. And I went home. And I was with my dog. I flew private flight home from Panama to uh, Atlanta, uh, where I was with my, my dog. And uh, he died in my arms. And I am eternally grateful to everybody involved with the production for allowing that to happen. I actually did all the scene as one shot and um, and considered keeping it in one shot uh, because it worked pretty well, but I decided to let it go with cuts. But I think it's one of the more successful scenes. And, you know, we're just talking about expositional stuff. And I always take it as a great challenge as a film director and as a writer to write expositional scenes, whether they're this scene or the scene in the car where Ratcatcher 2 is talking about her dad, and to be able to make them interesting cinematically in some respect. And that was, uh, and also to add humor to keep people going and to be able to make a purely expositional scene something fun. And I think that this scene does that pretty well. I didn't ask Dave Dasmalchian to say that. Yeah, he did that on his own. But I think he was feeling left out because he didn't have any lines in that scene. One of my favorite songs of all time is the Pixies' Hey. So the possibility of being able to use it in this film and the way that we do it in such a big way uh, was, was so fun to me. It really is one of my favorite all-time songs. You know, a lot of people know I uh, music is a real big part of the making of my films. So, for instance, all of these songs, besides the original song that was written by Grandson, were written into the screenplay for the whole movie. So I decided upon all of these musical numbers, whether it's just a gigolo or this or whatever, they were written into the screenplay and I, I put them in the movie. Yeah, no. Also, the other thing I do is we write music ahead of time. So the score written by John Murphy, a lot of the big main pieces, the big Team One theme when they're walking in front of the, the uh, American flag, the big... Uh, theme at the end when they're walking they decide to go back to try to defeat Starro. All of that those musical themes were written before we shot and we play that music on set and we play all this music on set we have, the, we had the Pixies Hey playing so loudly as we shot this with a phantom camera hey. probably the most iconic moment from the movie a lot of people think there's some sexual tension between Rick Flagg and uh Harley Quinn, and I always thought that was true from the drawing the storyboards. I think that there's a, a sort of sad moment there between the two of them where maybe there is some sexual tension, and maybe he does have a little crush on her, and maybe when he comes to save her, she sees a guy who's actually a good guy for the first time in her life. It should be no surprise to anyone, John Cena is very good at uh, stunt work and fight chor choreography. That is a practical effect, believe it or not. Not all of it. Obviously, the, the shark is fake, but the body itself is something that Legacy built. And we tore apart on set with wires. 
and then we shot that body being torn apart and put King Shark into it. This set actually, the exterior set here, the exterior of Jotunheim, may actually be bigger than my beachfront set. This set was enormous, so we built the you know, first couple floors of the outside of the building. Um, and then we built the entire parking lot and all of that stuff around there. And that was an incredibly important set where we went on for a lot of days. And one of the crazy things about that set was some days in Atlanta were so freezing cold that it was almost impossible to shoot. I remember the first time we were supposed to shoot the rain scene. It was so cold outside we had to push and rearrange our, our, our call sheet to push that to a different day and then other days it was really sunny and warm and so keeping things sort of looking consistent out there was incredibly uh, difficult along with shooting the astronauts on the very first day the other thing we shot was those moments with the security dispatcher in that room as it you know all the way through getting exploded and a very interesting story about that actress who plays her is that I had a restaurant I go to in Atlanta that I frequent and one day I went, and I had a waitress who was very nice. And she came up, and she said, I'm an actress. And she, like, gave me her card or something, if, if you know. And I'm like, you know, we're actually looking for Latin American actors who are not easy to come across as they are in other places in Atlanta, Georgia. So I went, and we went uh, that, like, next day or whatever. And I sat down with Simon Hatt and... Peter Safran, two of our producers, and we were watching some auditions for that character. And I said to Simon, I said, hey, listen, I have this card. And I gave him the card. And I said, we should have her come in an audition. I don't know if she's any good or if she's a real actor or whatever, but let's let's have her come in on an audition. He's like, okay. And so we watched the auditions, and there was one girl who was by far the best at uh, being the security dispatcher. And I'm like, oh, well, that person should be cast for sure. And <laughs> then we looked at the name on the card, and it was that same person. That's totally true. And I just didn't recognize her because she had her. She was like dressed like a waitress when she did when she waited tables, and she was kind of more dolled up or something when she was uh, auditioning. And so I couldn't tell it was the same person. And so that's how we found that actor. Strange coincidences. Another enormous set that we built was here with the star what we call the star crossed and here we find what a piece of crap the thinker really is that he's basically been torturing starro for no reason these these actors were great they had to be stuck in those masks all day long in those cages not being able to see This is uh, probably one of the most gory moments I've ever shot on film. It really is something like out of, uh, you know, Day of the Dead or something. I don't know why Thinker is doing all those things to Starro. I think he's just a sadist, honestly. He's a, a pretty bad guy. Yeah, I don't know why I said Suarez was the worst guy in the movie, because it's probably Thinker. That's meant to be derisive. I don't know if he has very much Sorry, goodness in him. These two are here to kill you. It's out of my hands. We need to help these people. You know, one of the things was 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 to be able to create these characters who were not all black and white and who had different shades of gray. And I think that also includes Starro, who I have a great feeling for. Now, he seems like he's a bad guy because he's a giant walking starfish who kills a bunch of people. 
But honestly, if I was Starro and I was happy floating around in outer space and taken out of outer space and put into this pit where I could barely fit and was tortured for no reason. Because remember, Starro has the consciousness of all of these human beings who are attached to him. So he is all of those people. And Thinker is doing whatever he wants, just tearing them apart. That uh, that he's a, he's a victim. And that doesn't mean what he does is, is okay, but I do have some feeling for him for absolute sure. You know, and this is where we find that, you know, basically Amanda Waller is not sending them on this mission to protect anyone. She's sending them there to cover up the fact that the United States has had a part in these illegal experiments. And that's what they're dying for is that, which I don't think Rick Flagg is, is good with. I think Rick Flagg has seen a lot of ugly stuff. I don't think that Rick Flagg is against sacrificing anything, but I think in this moment he's just had enough and he's through, you know, allowing, you know, basically being an enabler to the United States government in this world uh, to be able to do whatever they want. And he, he reaches his breaking point. I can't let you do that, Colonel. Peacemaker, on the other hand, is has been secretly sent there by Amanda Waller. Um to watch over and he's been told the whole truth from the beginning so he's always known that they were there to cover up these horrible deeds because amanda waller knew that he would be okay with hearing what the real situation was and making this hard choice that needs to be made You know, and I understand Peacemaker's point of view here. He's saying, what he's saying is, you know, he's not saying it's good that they experiment on children. He thinks that's bad. Peacemaker isn't evil, but he does think that that's over now from his point of view. And they need to cover this up because it will cause more problems on an international scale. You know? And it may seem bad that Peacemaker is saying that, but I think the bad thing that Peacemaker really does, he does in a second. And a lot of what the Peacemaker series ends up being about is about Peacemaker coming to terms with some of the things that he did in this movie. Oh, and here I, I really, you know, I kill so many people in this movie, and uh, I really feel bad about it. But I have to say, I feel especially bad about killing the thinker because he doesn't really, he's just, he's such a, a great character, and Peter Cavaldi's such a great guy. I just hate seeing any of these people die that I killed because they're all so good in their roles, and I would like to see more from all of them. So it, it sucks that I kill them. This is kind of more of a horror movie moment here for Ratcatcher 2 as this thing tries to get to her and Sebastian finds a way out because he's a little, little genius. There was a scene earlier where we learned that Sebastian is, according to Ratcatcher, the smartest rat in the world. So I think he's a mutant of sorts where he's just much smarter than other rats, which is why he's able to... He's not really anthropomorphized, you know, completely. Um, he just is an incredibly intelligent rat. And here, the thinker meets his fateful end. Uh, <laughs> now, it may look like we put a lot of padding in John Cena's mouth here, but the truth is he had two surgery the day before. And his mouth was all swollen in these shots. So he had to do the first part of this fight sequence after having just had two surgery. But being the trooper that he is, he, you know, on with the show. I thought this was a pretty cool shot when uh, 
when we first put this together and, and, uh, and I wasn't sure if it was going to work when I first designed it. So you had the way we shot it is it's obviously not a mirror because we would see the cameras. So we had to figure out how to shoot the scene and then uh, as a reflection and then put the reflection on the, the helmet, which is a totally not real helmet. Those are like the feeding tubes for the star cross that he's throwing them through. And the idea here was, and, and I'm not sure if it works or not. The idea here is, you know, I think most, a lot of people seem to think that that Rick is going to live. And um, Rick is the, the, the good guy in this situation of the two of them. Um, and by having Peacemaker sort of having the upper hand in this action sequence from the beginning, you know, you start to think that what ha usually happens in a movie with those things is that person will have the upper hand. And then all of a sudden at the last minute, the good guy gets the upper hand and kills the bad guy. Uh, but, you know, subverting expectations is what this movie is all about. And so that isn't what happens. And I think here you'd also see a little bit of an uglier side of, I mean, he's, he's angry. I think to, to, to Rick, Peacemaker uh, exemplifies everything about the United States that he's angry at right now. And this happens. This shot was one of the most controversial shots in the whole movie. There was a lot of back and forth about whether we should go inside his body for that shot. I was for it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, the Street Fighter movies, and they do that sometimes in those and other films. I think Street Fighter was the first time to do it. But I wanted to show Rick. Rick is, Rick is dead. Like, we see his heart pierced. Like, he's dead here. There's... There's not much going back from this without time travel. And I love John Cena and Joel Kinnaman in the scene. They're both so good. And you see here that John is not happy about this. But now he's let the monster out of the cage and it's gone too far. And so this moment where he sees Daniela, you know, Cleo Caso, this is where he takes it a step too far, I think. And I think this is a big moment for Ratcatcher, too, too, because she could easily, at this point, give him the drive and they could go on. But she doesn't do that. She decides to take a different path. She, she takes the road less traveled in that situation. And I think we learn a little bit about who she really is in that moment. And honestly, you know, Ratcatcher, too, is the heart of this movie. Um, I guess I said that earlier about Polka Dot Man in terms of you know, he's sort of the aesthetic cinematic heart of the movie in terms of like how the storytelling is different. But in true terms of like the true heart, and I love this shot of John Cena. I just think that's where I go, oh, God, I want to make a TV show with that guy because we only saw the very surface of what he's capable of here. But I think that uh, that really rat catcher is, is the heart of the, the movie because she's the one character who I think is overall good and not perfect there she's begging for her life there <laughs> when it comes to her life she's she wants to you know she wants to save it but at the end of the day she's the uh she's the hero she's the, the true hero here this was the scene that we shot on the second day of uh our shooting so we shot this again very early on Now, Steve Agee plays King Shark on set. So the same guy who plays John Economos um, is also King Shark in all these scenes. And so there is a lot of Steve in the way the character moves, in the way the character acts. He is the template for the character. And we animate him and then uh, Sly Stallone comes in and does the voice. These things are called Clyrax. They were actually designed by uh, my assistant, uh, Meg, Stapleton, um, who was my assistant for a number of years, and she's also a uh, graphic artist, and she designed these little fellows who are very cute, but end up being not the, the greatest little creatures in the world. Again, I see King Shark even more so than the other characters. He's a character who's outside of everything. He doesn't 
really feel like he belongs with anyone. He's, you know, watches people in the streets like they're on a different planet. And I don't think anybody's ever treated him too well. And so he finds these little fish that he thinks are playing with him. And then that makes him really happy. You know, kind of like a sad dog who finds another dog playing with him and is, is all of a sudden happy that a dog is giving another dog is giving him the time of day. One of our trailers we cut with a piece of this interaction between them about Milton. And it did get the biggest laugh in theaters when we tested it. And I just didn't want to ruin the moment for people to know that Milton dies. Because the fun for me is that we kind of see Milton in the background of all of these shots for a long time now. From the time they he's in the big uh, shot when they're approaching Jotunheim in the rain. And he's just always in the background, but we never see him. And it's kind of like... Oh, where'd that Milton guy go? Is, is that Milton guy still back there? Why are we not ever focusing on him? And so that's what the characters are doing. So I think it all leads up to this moment where, and I think that, you know, and David Desmelty and I talked a lot about this. I don't know if he really cares about Milton at all. I think he's, you know, I, th I think Polka Dot Man is the kind of guy who's, you know, he's like, oh, now that this guy is dead, I'm going to, benefit from my own sadness you know he just loves them now now they're best friends all of a sudden now that he can benefit from the attention and then here's where he makes the fatal mistake I love plans that go wrong in movies that you set up the plan that's going to happen and how it's going to happen and what you're going to do and then our own characters make everything go wrong. They just screw up. So these shots were, this was a particularly hard sequence. I, I say more time was spent on these shots per, per minute than any other shots in the movie than any other sequence because we had an office building and then we reinforced the office building and filled it with actual water um you know i don't mean we had a real office building we built the office floor on set we filled it with water and then we uh then we we we, we built a tilted version of the office building so we had and then we built a version of of uh, like a well, I guess that was it. I guess it was the three different versions. So the office building, the version with water, and then the tilted version. And trying to piece all these things together took an incredible amount of planning to get them right. It was very hard. And so that's real water in there. And it's uh, there's times when it's, it's a lot of times when there's VFX that is adding to what we're seeing. But that's actually our characters, our actors in real water. Oftentimes, they're stunt actors in water. I find it incredibly sad when the Clyrex eat King Shark. Uh, he just found his found these friends and they totally betrayed him. That quick zoom in in one of my best friends, George Contarini's, who is uh, came in for the day and I put him in an outfit to give him a cameo and of course the one shot he ends up in his, his arm is over his face which I feel bad about but I just said his name on the behind the scenes so you know again this stuff was also had to be shot in a lot of different little pieces it really did take a lot of planning now I have read that when your head gets cut off sometimes you you stay alive for a couple seconds so that's what this that's what this is for the Coronel. So this was all shot very high up in the air. Um to get all of this stuff done and again in a bunch of different pieces because then the piece that they jump off of was also a, a different piece that we had to build and the, 
piece that they landed on on the other side was a different piece. All different pieces. That, so that's, that's a piece. Then this is another piece. And then that's yet another piece. Those are all different pieces that we're shooting to fit together. And so in that shot, Polka Dot Man and Margo are together, but Idris below is, uh, is in another location, another set that we built. Not good luck for Bloodsport. Again, hard stuff to shoot. We had a piece of a piece of uh, set that we built that would kind of fall in little increments that we had to shoot him on. And then this piece, which was the first floor that we built separately, which was another big set. All that dust. I was pretty excited the day we shot that push in shot to blood sport with the dust falling in because I watched it in real time afterwards and I thought it looked so cool. This of course is a call back to the beginning of the movie where Peacemaker claims that he would use smaller bullets that will go through blood sports bullets, which seem to be uh, all talk and no action now. Don't worry about Peacemaker. He's just fine. He's okay. Don't worry about him. Oh, don't worry. He looks dead. He's not dead. Danielle, uh, Danielle has such easy access to her emotions that it was uh, disconcerting at times. She really is just, you know, she just goes there immediately. It's just so easy to shoot. That uh, that king shark gnawing on that head was based on my dog gnawing on things and what he looked like while he was doing that. I remember the day we shot this scene, actually, Kevin Feige and Lou D'Esposito from Marvel were on set and I'm like you know the heads of Marvel and uh, it, it, they, they were just visiting me and uh, and I knew that they were seeing that Star was the bad guy and I was like oh boy but of course they kept it a secret And here we see Starro the Conqueror. Now, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should keep his sort of bright Jeff Koons color scheme. And I decided that if we're going to do it, let's lean into it. Let's keep the uh, pink and cerulean blue and just let it be what it is. And, uh, and that's what we did. So he's this giant, terrifying, kind of gross thing. But also these kind of bright, garish pop art colors. And there he is releasing his starlings, as we called them, as baby starros that are going to all a part of his consciousness and will come down in on these folks and connect them to him so that they're all a part of one creature.
Yeah, again, I remember that these days were extremely warm, whereas earlier days just, you know, which is just supposed to be a couple hours earlier in the film or, you know, whatever, a half hour earlier in the film were very, very freezing cold. And even, you know, Suarez here, this piece of shit, I wanted to see his sadness because he had a dream. He wanted to be the boss of everyone and he wanted to be the head of Corto Maltese and he got his dream for about... 24 hours and it was over and we see his sadness losing that and even him maybe we can feel a little bit of sorry for but not much he's pretty much a jerk and then this poor guy he thinks he's general vera he thinks he's going to be the boss now he's excited that lasts even less long than suarez's hope generales nosotros my friend Michaela Hoover is there in the background. Uh, she plays the secretary, Camila. She gets blood splattered on her. She loves that shot of her getting blood splattered on her. Michaela has been in a lot of my movies, too. She was in uh, Super. She was in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. And now here she's a really close friend. So we had to make these masks, you know. We had, you know, of course, hundreds of star cross. So we have different kinds of masks. We have ones that are up front, ones that are in the middle, and ones that are way in the background. The ones up front, like the one Suarez is wearing and these guys are wearing, are, are really well-sculpted, well-molded things. The eyes are CG, but the rest of the, the masks are completely real. And then in some places, we have these like really crappy masks in the background that we, uh, you know, for, for people that are further away. Uh, John Economos in the comic books really looks a lot like my friend uh, Steve Agee. So when I was rereading the Suicide Squad comics and I was thinking about doing this film, I'm like, oh, my God, Steve Agee has got to be Economos. And... Uh, and he is. And of course, Economos ends up being one of the major characters in the Peacemaker series. That dog is real. <laughs> I mean, obviously he's real. That dog was just sitting there. And he got really afraid because people started screaming and running. And luckily, one of our cameramen was there to shoot him. And here we have old Bloodsport having his crisis of faith. He's about to walk away. He's listening to her. But at the end of the day, as big of a jerk as he is, he can't just watch a whole city die because of what he did. Dave, <laughs> you've noticed in that little beat there, Sebastian, that is the most anthropomorphic thing that Sebastian does in the whole movie, is that after she says, I know you sense good in you for a reason, Sebastian jumps up and throws his arms up into the air in triumph because he was right the whole time. It's, it's, it, I, you really don't even notice it, I don't think, usually when you're watching it. But if you're really looking at it, it's hilarious to me. And it's, it's a bit much, but I, I think it's funny as hell. Creel, turn around now! And here we have all of them coming together 
and heroism for different reasons, I think. I think Ratcatcher's definitely right. You know, she's doing it for the right reasons. I'm not sure exactly why the rest of them are doing it. I think, you know, they're friends. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, have, I think King Shark, every time I see King Shark here, I'm like, I think he has no idea what's going on. <laughs> he's just he's just following these people he likes, <laughs> especially Ratcatcher, too. And here we have Flo Crawley and her uh, act of heroism. And then we see the other folks, Jen Holland and as Amelia Harcourt, come into their own, make the right choice, do the right thing. <laughs> that, that, that's that's Dale. Our uh, he was our, our our military consultant on the film and consultant for a lot of different uh, military things. He's a great guy, and he, and I loved I loved using his name and calling him a dickhead there, which I had a uh, uh, Tanache ad on the day. Here we have these guys running through the streets of Cologne, Panama. You can see all those colors are real. Um, Cologne is a city that's basically largely been abandoned in places. And so um, it's just kind of, you know, falling apart in certain places. And people live there, but they're squatting. There's a lot of stray animals around. We uh, cast and crew brought home a lot of different animals or our uh Producer Peter Safran has a cat from there. David Das Malchian brought home a cat from there. You know, one of our grips brought home a dog. I helped save a dog that is now has a home in Panama on a farm. It was a, a great. We named her Atlanta, and we sort of have the guys teaming up to fight. Not sort of. They do team up to fight. And here I think we see Idris Elba's character falling into the position of leadership that he was born to do. And he's able to do it because he has noticed what, you know, each of his teammates is good at over the events of the past, uh, you know, 48 hours. And King Shark, King Shark is good at eating. One of my favorite moments to shoot was the polka dot man's mom hit, knocking down the building. And also, the, the most shocking, obviously, and perhaps saddest moment in the movie is, is coming up. Peacemaker, or polka dot man, I mean, finally fulfills his, uh, his calling as a superhero. He's, he's not a supervillain. He realizes it in this moment. And he sees the truth there right before he... I'm a superhero! Right before that happens. And everything kind of goes to hell in a handbasket now. In my first draft, Polka Dot Man did not die. And it seemed like when I was writing my second, my rewrite, it just seemed like the right place to go. Um, and I, I hated it because I love the character and I think he's one of the best characters in the whole movie. But I, uh, I think that the stakes had to keep going throughout the whole show and not just have a bunch of people dying in the, the beginning of the movie and not at the end. But I think the relationship here is important between Bloodsport and Ratcatcher 2. He said to her, I'll get you out of here alive. And she said, no, I'll get you out of here alive. And they were both right. As you'll find out in a moment. So he saved her life. And now she is about to return the favor. Sí. 
<laughs> yes, one of my favorite scores ever by John Murphy, my pieces of score. But here we see, I think, really what to me is in a great way the heart of the film, which is Bloodsport, who is our protagonist, is not the guy who stops the creature. It is him allowing uh, the other characters around him, specifically the women around him, to sort of save the day. And it is through him confronting his deepest, darkest fear and his nightmare and being vulnerable for a moment that allows him to make it through all of this. And here you see that Ratcatcher 2 has her arm around Idris there. She's protecting him. And in the same way, in a moment, you'll see her father has his arm around her. And what she's doing, from my point of view, is that she says very clearly that she wishes that that, that he could experience a father's love in the way that she did and she's passing that on to him because she did have that because as problematic as her father is he loved her and uh and she's she's able to give that to him she's able to pass that love on to him and here we have he's with her in the same way and he'll put his arm around her in the same way in a moment And there we have just Dan- Daniela at her best. Just that was a great moment getting that shot of her crying and just the way the camera was moving with her emotions was perfect. And then, of course, Harley, who believed that God had given her the javelin for a reason and she didn't know what it was, uh, was correct. And one of my favorite little moments I've ever shot, but also probably the strangest moment is Harley being surrounded by beautiful street rats swimming through eye fluid as they begin to tear apart the eye little by little and blood bursts around her and somehow, strangely, it's all beautiful. I think it. And what we call the raptism is over. And Idris Elba's character, Bloodsport, awakes into a new world where he has returned with something that is different than what he had before the beginning of the movie on his journey. And there we see Starro, who in his own way, is a a victim of all of this nonsense that's been happening, and it didn't need to be. And despite the moment of triumph there for Ratcatcher 2, she sees that there's something there more to the story. This was the last shot we did in the whole movie on the last day. Um, Actually, we did one visual effect shot, but, but other than that, we did this, and it was Harley coming out of that goo on set in Atlanta, and then uh, Margot came over and hugged me. That's my dog, Wesley, being held by my old assistant, Meg. That's the dog who passed away, and uh, we shot this earlier in the, the, the shoot. Wesley Von Spears. I loved him. That's my dad. Oh, I'm sure there's a million things that I haven't talked about in this movie that I will regret, but I feel happy with it. I'm watching it now, and uh, I feel good about it.
And here we have Idris, uh, you know, making a, a deal with Viola, which is different than what Rick Flagg wanted. And I think that, you know, Harley Quinn is probably not the same choice that she would have made just to screw Viola. And I think Harley doesn't think so much about what happens. And there we see uh, Amelia Harcourt and Economos just sort of pretending like Viola doesn't notice them. We worked hard on these shots visual effects wise. And I think that's one of the sweetest moments of Harley right there, is that she's she doesn't even know who this, the guy's name is. She forgets that his name is Bloodsport or Robert or whatever she would call him, and she thinks his name is Milton because that's the last name she heard, and she's goofball. But she's trying to be sweet to him, and that's where I think that we sort of see a softer, sweeter side to Harley Quinn. No. One of my favorite bands is the band Culture Abuse. This is their song. It was a song I thought about using very, very early on. And, you know, a lot of the, the movies I've shot, I feel like the, the real key moment, the, the ending moment is in a moment, you know, five minutes before the actual ending of the film. But I think that's not true here. I think that throughout this movie, rats have been goodness and... Uh, they may not represent goodness in real life, but in this movie, they do. And at the end of the movie, we have him with his fear of rats and overcoming that fear in a very real way and embracing that small part of himself uh, that is good. And I love it. I love this moment. I love it. Framestore did the visual effects on the rat. They did an amazing job. And uh, and I think it's really beautiful. And I cried when I wrote it, and I was really moved when Idris performed it, and I was even more moved when Fred Raskin cut it together. And uh, I love the moment. And ending on the happy rat, and just, I couldn't be happier. And that's the movie, except one thing. Oh, look at this. This is all 100% Sean Gunn, by the way. All these noises, that's 100% his acting. Just, you know, we motion captured all of this. And he's he did all of this. He can't pop open his eyes that big, but we approximate it. And there Weasel goes. By the way, I don't think he really killed 27 children. I think he is just in need of a good lawyer. I think somebody else did. I think he, Weasel's a good guy. He's an animal. Actually, when I was shooting, <laughs> when I was shooting the scene, and we we're first talking about shooting Weasel at the beginning of the movie with Sean, I said, "You know, it's kind of like they just take a German Shepherd and just set him on the ship and put a put a, a life vest on him or whatever, and throw him off the board in off the, the 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 back of the ship into the ocean." Like Weasel is an animal. Like he has no clue what's happening, and that's what. Um, that's how Sean played him. He's an animal. And here we have Grandson again singing Oh No, one of my favorite songs of the past few years that I was excited to use. We used it again when we uh, did our first little sneak peek of the movie. D. Bradley Baker. That's the name of the, the guy who did the uh, Sebastian voice. He's pretty amazing. So many good people that we worked with. This really was the most fun I ever had working on a film. It was the greatest cast I've ever worked with. Um, and I just, I love making a movie. I've been making movies now 
for 25 years. And I started in 1995, and I felt like for the first time in my life, I'm past some of the anxiety I used to carry with me all the time while making films. And on this movie, I got to relax and just be creative. And over the hardships of the past few years, uh, you know, that, that I went through right before Suicide Squad, I think I was able to refocus on what I loved most about making movies. And it wasn't the money, it wasn't the notoriety, it wasn't the status. It was the pure joy of the creative process and the joy of collaborating with other artists on creating something uh, to the best of my ability. And that's what this movie was for me. And when I had to decide what I was going to do, I just took on the project that excited me the most creatively, and that was this movie. So we'll see how it goes from here. But uh, as of this as of this time, the movie hasn't even come out in theaters yet, hasn't shown on TV yet, haven't had a DVD release. None of these things have happened um, and hasn't been released on streaming. We uh, we just are uh, we're here. But for me, I'm on to the next thing. I'm on to my next movie. I'm on to the I'm almost done shooting the Peacemaker TV show, which is a sequel to this show which we'll see in a second so you'll see in a second at the very end of this you'll see a little sneak peek of what's coming with peacemaker but i'm i'm into my next thing but but looking back and watching this movie and thinking of the memories of all the the great moments i had on set with these people from start to finish on the cast in the crew uh i just couldn't be happier really there's our great pas they deserve a big shout out this uh suite of music kind of goes through the different themes from the movie by John Murphy and uh, is a fun thing to you know just kind of relive all that talking during the credits on a director's commentary is also one of the strangest things because I'm really just I'm looking over at the people in the booth right now so it's it's just uh it's just talking about what the the, the talk about pink i guess or the uh yellow font that we chose to use which actually are things that we actually uh sort of suffer over making a movie what font are we going to use how is uh how are these names going to look what's the color of the background look at the texture of the background we worked hard on that but it may not be that exciting to talk about we do have the little logos of the characters but so i'm just sitting here talking uh and uh, trying to think of anything that I forgot to tell you guys during the movie. But thank you for watching. I do appreciate anybody who's actually listened to this entire director's commentary. I hope it isn't boring. It's extremely, uh, I would think it was really boring. So we'll see what you guys think when you, when you listen to it. But uh, hopefully I didn't bore you. Hopefully I gave you some information that you don't already have. Once again, I'm already beating myself up for not taking notes because I know that next time I do a director's commentary, I'm, I'm telling myself next time I'm going to write down things that I want to say instead of just going off the cuff. But I'm very busy right now, guys. I, 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 I didn't have time. I'm doing a TV show. We're doing eight episodes. I'm directing five of those. I'm about to do Guardians Volume 3. I have to draw storyboards for that. Uh, I'm doing press for the Suicide Squad. I'm very nervous about all that, you know, and how that's going to go. So the whole thing is I've I've got a lot of stuff. I've got excuses for why I'm not more prepared for this moment and and didn't do a, a better job of of serving you as commentary listeners. But, you know, I had other things that I made priorities. So I'm sorry for that. I apologize. You know, I you know, I guess that's what happens. I guess you talk over the credits long enough and you get to the apologies. And that's really all that's left is just me and my low self-esteem over the fact that I didn't prepare well enough for this commentary. And I didn't. And I apologize for that. But I'm waiting for the Peacemaker stuff, you know, so... Here's all our songs. Let's see. What songs did we? Sucker's Prayer is a Decemberist. I really like that song. Uh, yeah. What else? Whistle for the Choir, of course. The Fratellis. Rain. Look at all those names. Hey, Black Francis. Wow, how cool. 
I guess I ain't, ain't got nobody as credited because uh, Harley sings it at one point, besides the music playing. And the, one of the funny things about that is Margot Robbie can do anything but sing, but the minute she sang, it was not, that's not her greatest gift. You saw all the special thanks go by, a lot of restaurants that I really love in Atlanta that were so nice to me, a lot of people that watched the movie and gave their notes and helped us out, so many uh, good friends and, and family members that, that helped me out with all this that I'm incredibly grateful to them. American Humane Society, we did not harm any rats. We were very, very nice. Not only did we not harm rats, we spoiled the hell out of those rats. I played with those rats every day. Uh, carried them around with me like little babies, and th- we treated the rats well. And here we have our post credit scene. Dr. Alande, who is uh, leading us to who's alive? Who is it? Is it Rick Flagg? Is it Polka Dot Man? Oh, no. It is peacemaker and these will be two of the regulars amelia harcourt and jenna Kanamos, and uh, of course daniel brooks character and vigilante played by freddie stroma they're going to be some of the regular characters in uh, the peacemaker tv series anyway i love y'all thank you for being cinema fans thank you for supporting this movie and i'll see you guys on what's next bye bye